I was recently watching one of Adrian Black's Digital Basement videos where he described a combination of a standard Commodore 64 Atari style joystick with the DB9 connector um, and a Nintendo gamepad. And his issue is that joysticks, I mean, they're not great to use. Uh, everyone has those issues of trying to get the sticky suction cups to stick to the table and trying to use these buttons, it's, they're, they're unwieldy. And I, I tend to agree with that. Uh, I don't particularly like them. This one in particular doesn't work in general. The uh, switches internal, internally to this have, I don't know, died. Uh, this was a quick shot clone anyway. Uh, it has multiple modes for Atari, MSX, Amstrad, Sega. You can choose them. But uh, yeah, I, I liked his idea of, of switching over to using a Nintendo gamepad or just any kind of uh, gamepad that has a d-pad and at least one button will suffice to replace the joystick for those consoles as they only have the, the directionals and a single fire button. Um, his idea also included the use of one button for fire and another button pressed up so that in a lot of games where you're using the d-pad for movement uh, left and right moves left and right and up is what you would use for jump so he had a second button assigned for jump. Makes perfect sense. Um, I really like that idea and I actually set out to do the same thing, but while I was kind of thinking about it, I had a little bit of an idea. Um, why don't we add extra functionality? I mean, we've got a gamepad. This one in particular I pulled from my collection. Uh, it was broken long, long time ago and uh, I actually pulled the connector off of it. So the connector was actually broken on it. So. Um, this one was pretty much ripe for experimentation. Uh, and I've got to say, I, I haven't revisited this controller. I pulled it out of the, the depths of my cupboard, but I haven't revisited this a long time. And I've noticed just, just while re-looking at it, just the attention to detail that Nintendo have really put into this. Look at that. That's a, uh, that's a pressed brass collar. Like, and these, these pin connectors are just phenomenally like high quality. You gotta, you gotta admit, Nintendo has put some incredible work into their consoles, even just the, the controllers. And this is the, the NES, so you can imagine how long ago this was. Anyway, I'm going off on a tangent. What I had planned to do uh, was shove a microcontroller in here and use the extra buttons to serve additional purposes. Um, so what we could actually do is pick up the signal that the NES pad sends out to the NES console. Um, in these Nintendo controllers, it's actually quite a simple shift register. Thankfully, there are eight buttons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So they use an eight bit shift register uh, in order to send that data out. When the Nintendo, the console itself, the NES, wants to know what's on the, what's currently being pressed, it sends a signal to the, con the shift register in here to latch all the current positions of all of the individual buttons as an individual bit. It then pulses the clock eight times and reads what those signals are in order. I can't remember the exact order off the top of my head, but it's basically, for example, if you would pulse the clock once, you get the up, pulse it again, you get the left, you pulse it again, you get the right, you pulse it again, you get the down, so forth and so on. And once you've read those eight bits, you can tell exactly what's happening on that. And I believe the NES uh, console does that at 60 hertz, so it does it 60 times a second, so it can actually be run pretty quickly. Um, and if we hook into those, I know that I don't, can't remember again what the exact colors are here, but I'll play around with that as I experiment a bit. Um, there would be a power and a ground, for, for instance. Then there's the one, the input to the latch signal to tell the shift register in here to latch its, its data. And then there would be the clock and the data line out. Um, so yeah, this should actually be pretty easy to read with a, uh, like a PIC or an Atmega uh, Arduino style microcontroller, probably an Atmega because I have a handful of those lying around. And theoretically what I might be able to do even if there's enough room, I haven't actually torn this apart yet, but if there's enough room inside here, we might even be able to uh, re replace this con uh, this cable entirely with the cable off this old joystick, because the cable works fine, it's just the switches inside this joystick that are broken, and design a board that might be able to fit inside this entirely so that it's just 
on the outside a standard controller. But anyway, that's the plan. Um, let's get started. Okay, I'm back with a rough schematic based on the little bit of research I've just done quickly. So now the theory behind this schematic is the Commodore 64 actually outputs 5 volts, which can be used by joysticks or light pens, things like that. Uh, I believe a lot of joysticks use it to power quick shot or rapid fire uh, circuits, triple uh, five timers and whatnot. What we will be doing is using it to power the rest of this circuit. So it has 5 volts in ground, give you your rails, and then it has four, uh, sorry, five pin inputs. We've got up, down, left, right, and the fire pin. And it expects those and the joystick to be grounded. So they are typically held high inside internally in the Commodore 64. And when they are pulled down to ground, uh, that registers a button press on the joystick port. So what we've got here is five volts going into the Arduino and five volts also going into the Nintendo pad, which powers the shift register internally. The Arduino will periodically uh, toggle the latch and fire off the eight clock pulses to get the eight data bits for each individual button uh, state, current state. It will then decode that eight bits into its internal blah blah blah, and then use that state in order to put a voltage out on these five transistors. Now I'll probably just use typical uh, NPN transistors uh, for this. Uh, I don't think I would need to use anything better. Uh, transistors fine. I'll probably want to put some resistors on the end here just to make sure I don't feed too much current into these transistors, but that should be fine. Once we uh, send a pulse of voltage, bring those transistors high, they will actually connect the uh, signal from the, the pin from the joystick port so in this case, if we press down on the right, it would connect, it would send a voltage spike out to this pin on the transistor, which would connect between this right and the ground, the base here. So that is kind of the plan for now. Uh, I've just dug through my box of tricks and I've got these BC, uh, pretty low budget, They're just a BC547 uh, NPN transistor. I've also just, for prototyping purposes, found a couple of red LEDs and a breadboard and some wires. And let's get going and figure out how it's gonna work. So this is where I've gotten to. Um, I've got pretty much that circuit that I uh, had a second ago wired up. That's this one here. Yeah. So that's now this connection. So I've just got some pins going into the existing pins on the, the NES. I've got the Arduino plugged in to those pins and power. And then I've got power going into it. So this board would effectively be the Commodore 64 side of things with power coming in. And then I've got some red LEDs just down here, which uh, would signify the actual button presses being picked up by the Commodore 64. So in actual fact, these LEDs here, the between the uh, emitter and uh, power pin here, would be going to the uh, DB9 connector of the joystick uh, cable. But I've got a really basic program set up on my Arduino here, and as you can see, it's working pretty nicely. We have an up, we have a down, we have a left, and a right, and B is our jump, and A is our fire. The irony here is that the controller here, this 16 megahertz uh, at mega, what is it, a 328p? Yeah, 328p is controlling this where the Commodore 64 it's going to runs at 1 megahertz. But hey, that's modern technology for you. But anyway, works great. So now what I can do is muck around with the Arduino a little bit to see if I can add some extra functionality into this. Okay, it's a little bit later. I've had some time to muck around with the uh, Arduino and I'll just show a quick scroll down of the code here that I've put together. Um, it's a little bit, gotten a little bit complex. <laughs> Uh, a little bit more than I wanted to, but I had some good ideas uh, after having a look around at the different joystick uh, enhancers out there. But uh, this is what we've got. So we still have the base 
functionality. Actually, let's just hit reset on the Arduino just to make sure we're in a good spot. We still have the base up, down, left, right. A and B is jump. But now if you hold down the select button and press either B or A to select A or B modes, you will get, so if we hold, press B, puts the Arduino into rapid fire mode. So if we hold A now, fire blinks. And if we hold B, fire blinks a little bit faster. And if we hold both of them together, fire blinks very quickly. So that's giving us three different levels of auto fire with the same up, down, left, right. Now, if we hold select and go A, this puts us into what I found online referred to as waddle mode. Um, now, if you've played Commodore 64 games, uh, most likely the sporting games, so like uh, winter games, summer games, California games, those kind of, uh, you'll know that there is a mode where you have to basically waggle the joystick left and right really quickly, like that. So uh, what I did here is that you've got fire, up, down, left, right still, and fire. If you hold down B, it waddles the left and the right. Uh, I've also added if you hold down left while you waddle, while you hold down B, it waddles a bit slower. If you hold down right, it waddles faster. So you have those different speeds. That's all I've come up with at the moment. Uh, but now what I'll try to do is probably have a look inside here and see if there's a way that we can shoehorn all of this in here. All right, so I've taken the NES controller apart now, and as you can see, uh, in, on the inside we have pretty basic clamshell with a very uh, simple board, and I've taken this out and I've desoldered the, uh, the wire that was here. So we've got some really, really simple pads there. The four uh, D-pad, select start, B and A buttons. And then on the back here, we can see that the uh, that's the uh, the shift register, the 8-bit shift register chip. Um, yeah, so it's a fairly simple design internally, but what we're more focusing on is this area up here. So this is, this is how it goes into the case, that's the front. Um, and looking at that, we've got one, two, three, four, five pins for the wire, and the wire was routed down through here, and then it snaked up around here for some strain relief around these kind of ridged pins, went up around there and then down around here so that you pulled on it and it got caught on those ridges and didn't uh, didn't stress the internal connectors any. But um, yeah, what we're most interested in is kind of measurements around this area and also around the back side. So that goes over like that, that fits that way. So we're kind of looking at this area here and this area here. So Judging by this, this pin here, uh, sorry, this uh, standoff and this standoff here, they sit directly behind where the B and A button's here and the D-pad on this side. So that would be some extra relief from the board so that if you pressed on the buttons really hard and the board flexed up, you can see that there's a good amount of flex in this board, that would actually hold the board in place and stop the buttons from pressing back. So from that, we can surmise that if this is flush up against the bottom of the board, between the top of this and the bottom, that's how much space we have. So if we've got our trusty little ruler here, that looks like we get probably a good five millimeters of depth to work with if we're pressing up right up against this board. So five millimeters isn't a lot of space, but uh, especially when you consider your average, your standard PCB width is 1.6 millimeters there, but we can get PCBs made in uh, smaller widths. So if we, think about getting a PCB in one millimeter, that leaves us four mil uh, to work with. So I think we're probably gonna be looking at doing this with surface mount components instead of uh, uh, through hole components like this chip is. Because um, I mean, you're looking at that chip, that's already, that's that's four millimeters by itself. So yeah, we're looking at this, this chip would only have an extra millimeter on top of that. So. If we already put an extra millimeter on and then we try to put additional surface mount components on like a, uh, the Arduino, the Atmega uh, microcontroller, we'll pretty much already be out of space there. So surface mount components it is, which means I won't be able to use the, uh, the through hole uh, transistors that I was using as I mean, they're by themselves, they're, they're five mil as is plus the mounting height that that's just, that's not gonna work. So, but that's okay. I have some uh, small, 
uh, transistors, some BC, probably 847s, which would be the equivalent. Um, but yeah, I'm going to take some measurements off this, maybe we'll take some photos and mock it up so that I can line it up in, uh, in uh, my CAD program. And uh, yeah, see what I can, see if I can transpose the circuit diagram I made before, the schematic, into something that would fit in this, in this space here. Alright, so this is our schematic transposed into KiCad. Um, so let's go from right to left, we've got our C64 joystick up here. Um, that goes into a bank of transistors, as uh, shown before. So I'm using, I uh, decided to use BC847s for this, as they're, uh, yeah, I've got a bunch of them in stock, and they're a nice uh, match for the uh, 547s in surface mount, though. Um, they go through a 4K7, each of those go through a 4K7 resistor. They go into uh, five pins on the Atmega 328PB, because I, again, have some of those in stock. Um, we've also got some headers here for in-circuit serial programming, just so I can program this chip on the board if I want to add some updates. I can just pull it out and put some pins on there and, you know, add extra program to it. Uh, we've got a 10K resistor that pulls the res reset line on that CPU up to 5 volts to make sure it's not resetting constantly. And we have our pins from the NES board. So we've got one going to 5 volts, five going to ground, and then two, three, four going to these three pins on the Atmega CPU, or um, MCU, sorry. Um, and I've just routed them this weird way here. Um, that's purely for ease of routing on the uh, PCB uh, later, which we have here. So this is the PCB that I've designed. So you can see the measurements that I've taken uh, from the board there. Uh, and I've got a nice little cutout up in the top here. Uh, to skip around the uh, little screw mount. Um, and then we have uh, the one, two, three, four, five pins measured uh, that mount into the actual uh, the NES PCB. Um, and then we have on the right hand side here the output pins that go to the DB9 connector, they go into the transistors, they go into some resistors, and then they go into the uh, microcontroller down in the bottom here. And then in the middle there, there's just those uh, in-circuit uh, in serial programming pins for use. And if we open up the 3D view, that's kind of what it will look like once we get it done. I've also just put some text there and I've got my little logo on the back. So yeah, this should be interesting. So now I'm just going to have to uh, send this off to China to get made and uh, keep going once uh, once they get back to me. Hmm. Ooh, it's an exciting day because the mailman came. So we got this box from JLC PCB delivered today very fast with... Ooh, that's a, that's a sneaky peek for our upcoming video, but the one that we're actually looking at today is this box here, this bag here, which contains our fresh new NES Pad 2 C64 joystick adapter boards. So let's crack that open and see what we have. Oh, they are shiny. So these are the one millimeter PCB width. I don't know if that's focusing or not, but uh, nice and thin. We've got my logo on the back there. And we've got space for the Antmega, the NES pads and all the little components. And of course you have a minimum order, so we had to get five of them, but uh, I'm sure I can figure out something to do with these. So what we want to look at, first of all, is were my measurements good? So let's bring in the NES pad here. I've got it already set up with the board in there and I've, oops, thrown my pins everywhere, but if we put some pins in here, I'm not Soldering, actually, you know what we'll do. Look at that. Let's do it this way. Let's put them in here. So they should actually sit in there nice and tight. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Now let's see if they line up. Oh. Oh, would you look at that? They line up perfectly. And if we mount that in there. Uh, yep, yeah, and that 
misses that cutout. Absolutely spot on. I could not be happier with that fitment. Excellent. Okay. Let's figure out how to put this sucker together. Okie dokie then. So I've got my uh, board kind of stuck down to the bench here so we can have a nice stable pad to solder to. And I've got out my little black book of SMT components and I need to pick out parts for this. So let's look for these resistors. We were looking for 4K7. Looks like I've only got 4K3 or 5K1. I uh, probably should have planned for this earlier, but um, yeah, here we are. Let's go the lower one. Let's go some 4K3s. So we want how many? We want one, two, three, four, five of those. Let's scramble off. Two, three, four, five. Okay, pop the rest back. We also need one 10K, and I have some old stock 10K here. It is these ones. Let's grab one of those out if I can. Just the one. Alrighty. We also need uh, five transistors. They are here. We are on one, two, three, four, five. Transistors and we also need one. I don't want to use 0603 because I'm lazy, but I know I have some 0805, 0805s here. This is a 0.1 microfarad for that, and I believe that's it. So Let's get into it. Now, I'm really sorry about the shaky cam here. The zoom level is intense. And every time I move, I bump my camera. But here we are. Let's do it. Oh, we know what we also need. Our Atmega MCU. So I actually have a handful of them here, but we only really need the one. Well, hopefully. Anyway, let's get to work. Let's get all our components in the frame here. <laughs> get that. All right, what shall we start with? Let's start with the tricky stuff, the individual little components. So we're gonna need some really fine tip tweezers here. We're gonna need a butt of flux. So let's get my rosin soldering flux. Out. Ready to apply. Let's grab a nice fine tip Q tip for the application of that. Let's begin.
and uh, let's uh, figure out how to get that into our board. So I'm guessing, I mean obviously it needs to go in here, but I'm guessing I kind of want that to be flush up against the board as much as possible. I still will need a bit of height for the wires to go in here, so I might actually solder those on first, which will give us a guide on how much height we can get out of this. And then once we know that, we should be good to, yeah, put some pins in. So I've just finished the task of pulling that uh, donor joystick apart, the old uh, cloned quick shot. Um, and I oh, wanted to do it as fast as possible because as soon as I opened the body, it just reeked of old dog piss. So yeah, that was disgusting. Uh, I salvaged what I could, which was literally the cable and this. I'm going to grab that switch off the board because that's a fairly decent little toggle switch, but everything else was just disgusting. And in fact, after I pulled it apart, I disinfected and cleaned my entire bench down because that was just gross. But uh, yeah, now that we've got this uh, pin out, we've separated the cables and we actually have nine wires here. So now I'm going to need to trace each one of these back to its source, make a little uh, table of figuring out which one's which. I know we need one, two, three, four, six, uh, seven, and eight. So figure out what those are and put them to one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight. Too easy. I thought I might just show you uh, the process that I'm doing in uh, trying to get, figure these out. So what I've got is my multimeter set into uh, buzzy mode, which is continuity when we get continuity. It beeps. So I've got a little bit of solder uh, left over from when I was soldering the board. And I've just got that wrapped around my negative terminal here. And that the other end of that can go into any one of these pins. And then all I need to do is tap into the connector there, the conductor. Let's try this one. No. No. Oh, there we go. So yellow is pin one, so forth and so on. There are our wires soldered into the board. Buzzed out just the wires that we needed and put them in their respective pins, one through four and then six through seven, uh, six through eight for with seven and eight as power at the end there. That is coming along nicely. Okay, so now need to get our little headers into this board and I think what I'm going to do is put our header in like so, solder it on the back and then pull off this little jumper here and crop a whole bunch of that lead off because we don't need that much pinhead and in fact I don't believe that a pinhead will actually uh, fit but what we can also double check is just how much height we have to work with here because if you check that cable there we're already running pretty low so we want to make sure that that is nice and flush to the board as much as possible. It looks like we should actually get by pretty well. Yeah I think we'll be fine. Anyway uh, that's next steps, pins in. So what I just did was uh, struck a genius I think. <laughs> um, I used one of the boards that I hadn't actually put components onto yet and I had soldered the pins into the back here and using this as an alignment tool then I cropped off just the excess and pulled the little spaces off so now we have properly aligned pins that should be able to slide straight onto our board and now that board as you can see there can be mounted completely flush with the bottom. But this isn't the one that we want on there, so let's get the actual board on there, solder it in place, and let's look at programming it and testing it out. Now admittedly I probably should have programmed this before I soldered it down, but uh, here we are. So I've got my little uh, USB ASP programmer, uh, and I've just put some pin headers inside the uh, thingy here as you can see just so that what I can do hold it onto the board like so twist give it a little twist and hit program 
upload using programmer on my thingamo and not work. So we do not have a connection. All right, I'm gonna go troubleshoot that. Alrighty, we're done. So you'll have to excuse the background noise, it's just started raining outside, but this is what we've gotten up to. So uh, turns out I had uh, one of the, two of the pins actually backwards, you know, the clock and the latch, so it just wasn't working at all. And then on top of that, uh, on the microcontroller that I'm using inside this controller, uh, I am reusing the pins that are typically used for serial connections, and I was in the code I had started the serial chat, so it had completely killed the clock signal regardless. Anyway, a little bit of trial and error, figured it out. Then I made up this little test jig, so I've just put some pins into the uh, the DB9 the joystick plug here, and then run them over to the breadboard. Now, as I discussed earlier, when the button is pressed on a joystick, so fire, left, right, whatever, on the Commodore side or the joystick side, it actually grounds that pin, and that's what signifies to the, the, the console that that button has been pressed. So what I've done here on the little breadboard is I've got the little red LEDs with one pin going into the... Uh, the positive rail on my breadboard here and the other pin going to the output pin here. So the theory is that when the button is pressed on the joystick that grounds that pin which completes the circuit through the LED and lights it up. Uh, and as you can see we have victory uh, and that is including all of the special functions. So in this case the up B's button is up and we can go into the different modes. So if we go into rapid fire mode we get our three speeds and then if we go into waddle mode we get our three speeds of waddling. So now the only thing to do is uh, try it on my actual Commodore and hope that I don't fry the CIA chip. <laughs> but uh, yeah that's the joys of experimentation. See how we go. Moment of truth. We have my gamepad all together. Uh, I got my Commodore C64C, uh, my, my daily driver out uh, to test, and I just am so excited to see if this works or not. So I've got my uh, Pi1541 just breadboard majiga set up into the serial. Things powered up and ready to go. So let's fire this puppy up and see if this actually works or not. Okay, there we go. Let's load the file browser. Okay, run that. Now I've given it a little bit of thought. What I want to do for my first trial of this is run with a game that I know intimately. So this is actually one of my all-time favorite games uh, for the Commodore 64. Uh, this is Nebulous. So let's load that disk. Okay, so now the Pi is emulating that disk, so if we quit out of there and then we load that, and that will load the Nebulous game into memory. This is where I play the Jeopardy music because I do not have a fast load cart. Oh well, I should probably get around to making one of those one of these days. Okay, and we run it. Ah, uh, yes. So this is going to be a uh, cracked version with a demo. I think we can skip over that one. I believe this one also has trainers, so we'll disable those. There we go, we don't need the manual. Stop. There's our nebula floating screen. play a high score game and we do not want to reset the high scores. Ah, fantastic. All right. So now this game plays using joystick port 2. Here we go. All right. No smoke. Always a good sign. Let's hit fire. See what happens. Oh. Yes! <laughs> oh my god, it's working! It's working! It's working! Ah. Oh.
<laughs> oh. oh, that is so good. Can we kick kick the snowballs? Yes! Oh. Oh, how good is that? Snowballs don't go that far. Let's just wait here for that. Ah. Ah. Anyway, I am just so amazingly jazzed that this is working perfectly. Um, let's try. Oh, I'm gonna get knocked down. Let's try one of the other modes. Uh, no, then we're we'll actually great for this. Well, let's try water mode. Yep, he's gone back and forth. <laughs> a little bit slower. Ah, that's excellent. Okay, so let's try, let's reset this. Anyway, I'm super jazzed about this. I am going to have to tweak the uh, time settings, try a bunch of different games, see what's what, but look at that. Little circuit board in there. One of these fellas. Oh. Let's turn that off. Little circuit board sitting up there. 5 volts in, reads the Nintendo pad, gives us different outputs. That's fantastic. I'm so happy about that. Anyway, that's all I have for now. Thank you very much for watching, uh, and uh, stick around, I'll have some more soon. Bye.